All right, welcome to psychology, intro to psychology with Mr. S. Today we are gonna to talk about cognition in the field of cognitive psychology. So what is cognition? Cognition is the mental processes that are associated with thought, reasoning, knowing, language, perception, and memory. So cognition is how we come to understand the world through these processes. These are also known as higher cognitive processes. Cognitive psychology is a branch of psychology that studies these mental processes. And a cognitive psychologist can study many different aspects of these pr cognitive processes. And they can study it such as how we learn and remember information or how we perceive objects in space. But there's so much out there in terms of cognitive psychology and science. So we're gonna start off with concepts. Now, concepts are mental representations of objects that we perceive. And what they do is they put them into categories. So it helps us to make sense of the world. And it also helps us to group things together because that makes things much more likely for our survival and is an adaptive advantage in terms of evolution and grouping things, organizing to make things much more uh, suitable for that. So concepts could be living things such as plants or animals or inanimate objects such as a chair. So the mind organizes our experiences from the senses and it makes them intelligible, knowable. So in order to make sense of the world, we have to apply concepts because that is the way we understand what we are perceiving. And the mind has a categorical structure that gives meaning to our experience. So the mind is not just passively receiving input and information from the senses or external world, but rather the mind has this built in processing system that is organizing, planning, predicting, and processing the information that uh, we are experiences and it gives meaning to the experience. Let's look at two different types of concepts. We have a natural concept. They have defined characteristics and agreed upon rules. Put the example of a triangle. Every triangle has three sides. Doesn't matter what kind of triangle it is. The triangle necessarily by definition has three sides. Equilateral, isosceles, scaling. It wouldn't have four sides. No, there's not a triangle and a triangle is not the same thing as a square or a circle. And then we could see a formal concept does not define characteristics and agree upon rules. Let's say a chair. Now we group chairs together, but chairs can come in many different forms. And I put the examples of a rocking chair, wheelchair, desk chair. It's not that all chairs have four legs. And so there's, it's not necessarily universal, can be, and that's, I'm sure debated, but the difference between the formal and natural is one that has agreed upon rules and one that does not. Now let's go back and look at empiricism versus rationalism on concepts. This has been going on since the times of Plato and Aristotle. And I'm gonna specifically talk about the enlightenment time and with you know British empiricists like David Hume and Bishop Barclay and John Locke and rationalists like Spinoza, Leibniz and Descartes. So what is empiricism? Empiricism or empiricists argue that all knowledge comes through our experiences from the senses. It does not depend on a priori. So before, prior to, that's what a priori is, in, or innate concepts built into the mind. So, the, so we don't 
understand the world or know the world through concepts built to the mind. Rather, it is through experience that we come to know these concepts rather than the concepts already being in the mind prior to experience or independent of experience. On the other side, Rashness argues that we can know things about the world independent of experience. And now an example would be mathematics. So uh, one plus one is two. How do we know that? Do we know that from experience or is that already processed in the mind that we can distinguish one unit and another and that will be two? Or can we know the distance between me and let's just say someone whose arm slants distance from me? Do I need experience in order to see that there is space between us? That's what a rationalist will say that we can know things just by thinking, not by uh, experiencing over and over again through habits and custom, like David Hume would say. So I'm gonna put these philosophers here because I wanna give an example of how uh, this debate was being presented. And so David Hume argued that ideas, not innate concepts, so we have ideas about the world. They come from our perceptions. And these ideas are association, also known as empirical synthesis, between impressions, put perceptions and ideas, and they're broken down into simple and complex ideas. And so an example, if I perceive an object as a table, we can see that it has parts and our mind associates that table with its shape, size, and color. And so the table may have primary qualities, uh, but it could also have accidental qualities. And so how does the mind distinguish between the table and the chair or the table and the person sitting at the table? And so David Hume would say that we, the ideas, of the table are relations to these uh, simple and complex ideas that we don't, we view things as parts and not necessarily as one thing, as we can see. If there is a gray table, we see it's gray. We might see that it's large in size or might see that it's small. And where is the table? at in terms of its location. And so there are different things that we have to associate in order to come to know that it's a table. So what about rationalists like Leibniz? I would argue that we do have innate knowledge and ideas, concepts built into the mind, such as logic and mathematics. So an example would be the law of non-contradiction, which is that the the there are contradictions that you can't ever uh, make sense of. For example, I can't be in Boston and Japan at the same time. That's a contradiction, right? I may be in Boston physically, and let's just say like I'm doing a Zoom lecture in Japan, but that's not the same thing as me being in Japan or the principle of sufficient reasoning, which is that there is a sufficient reason for phenomena that we experience, such as the space between us, right? The objects in space, time, or other ideas that we think about. Now I would put Immanuel Kant in here because, well, I'm a big fan of Kant. I love Kant a lot. I he was, I would say, a mix of a, rationalist and empiricist because he accepts the claim that experience is necessary to make sense of the world. Like how do we have knowledge about the world without experience? Like, yes, experience is definitely uh, there. So he's saying, yeah, David Hume, you're right about that. But the thing is, is that Kant saw reason as something that's sort of like divine, like reason's highest 
uh, thing that there is, like reason. And then it begins to go down to our understanding. But reason is there and reason is universal. So we have to apply the concepts such as time and space in order to represent the world as appears to us. So we're not passively receiving information, but our mind is, is using concepts and we use, we use our judgments to apply those concepts. Example, the concept of unity is necessary for our conscious experience. We are having an experience, right? Is let's say I'm looking outside my window right now, but I also see that there's a piano. I see that there's a couch. I see the sun. I see the city skyline. I see different things. So what's going on? I'm viewing it as a whole, it's different parts. And how am I perceiving them and distinguishing uh, these different objects? And so Khan would say that all conscious experiences are necessarily unified. And we can think about problems today in cognitive neuroscience, such as the visual, semantic, and neural binding. Like how does our conscious experience, how does it all come to one, right? So when, we, when I'm looking, I could see that the occipital lobe behind my brain is at work, but I also am thinking about going on the beach. So I'm using my imagination and I'm going back into the past and thinking about all the awesome times I've had on the beach. Yeah, so I'm doing, my brain is doing a bunch of things and putting these bits and pieces together but how does it come to one? And that's what we would say the neural, it's a neural binding or visual binding problem uh, that we're still trying to understand how the brain ha uh, puts an experience, all of that sort together. So who was right? I'm gonna argue that Kant was right because they, he, you know, definitely, uh, you know, had respect for the empiricist and rationalist, but he wanted to solve this problem. Is, do we have uh, innate knowledge of the world or is all knowledge after experience? So they were all working in a framework. This was before modern science really took off in terms of where we are and our uh, advancements of medical imaging and the way that we could study the mind. So this was a different time where they didn't have the type of tool that we have today to study the mind. They definitely were right about things. So I would say that a lot of cognitive psychology and science appears to confirm the Kantian perspective that unified both the theories that yes, experience, but not experience alone, uh, because we have as I was saying before, categorical structure in our mind, our mind is uh, processing information a lot of times we're unaware of. And so how did, how does that come to be? How do we make sense of the world? Is it, um, so I would say it's also not a settled debate. I've had these conversations with professors and other students. And so it's not, this is not a definitive, like, yes, cognitive science totally supports Immanuel Kant on this issue. But I would say that the reason why I was that the main reason would be because if we don't have concepts, how does that give rise to mathematics, laws of logic and language where we have universal agreed upon rules and universal facts about things such as one plus one equals two and a square is not a triangle and the principle of non-contradiction and language. There's rules of grammar that's universal across languages around the world. And you take a child and you put them in a country or any place around the world, they can learn that language. And so we, ha we can't really make sense of the experiences without concepts. And here are the type of mental processes that uh, our mind has. We have reasoning, we have perception, learning, memory, attention, and language. Let's look at perception. So we have our senses, vision, hearing, smell, taste, touch. And so sensation is where 
the senses, they send the signals to these sensory receptors and our central nervous system. And so, for example, I'm looking outside my window. And so what's going on is the light is going to the eye, it's the retina and the lens, and then it's going into all sending the signal to the occipital lobe and the octic chiasm. And then that's processing and my brain is at work right now. It is, there's a lot of connections and a lot of activity going on. And so that's what sensation refers to, but then perception is how the mind interprets and organizes these sensory experiences. So when I am looking at a window, I'm seeing that it is a window and I'm seeing that there is an instrument right there. And I'm seeing that there's a, there are buildings and then there are people. And so this is where concepts come in because concepts are what organizes all of our experiences. 